Developed by Variable State and published by 505 Games, Virginia is truly a very special game. From the beginning, the game's main title screen prompts the player to press X to quote-unquote take a trip, a subtle way of hinting that the player is about to embark on something completely unique. The game begins with a scene where a key is inserted into a lockbox and sealed shut, the sound of the locking key reverberating in our ears. We are then introduced to our protagonist, essentially you, the player, staring at yourself in the mirror and breathing nervously. You reach for something inside your purse. Lipstick. Apply it and try to calm your nerves. You are Anne Tarver, and as you exit the bathroom, you find yourself in a hallway. Walking further down the hall, you begin to take note of your surroundings. Locked training rooms, symmetrical pictures on the walls. You seem to be in an office building, and straight ahead of you, people are standing in line. As you join them, waiting for your turn to move forward, there is a sense of anxiety. The ominous glow of a red light ahead of you accentuates this. Where are you going? As you move forward, a woman seems to check her notes and ushers you to move along to the left. You soon realize that you're backstage and stepping out in front of dozens of onlookers. Everyone applauds, along with the man on stage in front of you who extends his hand to congratulate you. It's now clear, you are a graduate, newly inducted into the ranks of the FBI. This is a proud moment. Probably something you've been waiting for. What just happened? Everyone is gone, and now you hear this overpowering sound of an EKG and breathing machine. What the hell is going on? You are soon given your first case, investigating the disappearance of a small boy. Your superiors partner you up with a veteran agent who's been shunned to a basement office for some reason. They've also asked you to keep a watchful eye on her. Apparently, she's been a problem for the Bureau. This, in a nutshell, is the basis of Virginia. And as the narrative progresses, the game becomes increasingly more demanding of your attention as it leads you scene by scene down a rabbit hole in which you'll have to question what is real and what is imaginary. Early on, co-directors Jonathan Burroughs and Terry Kenny knew they wanted to do an interactive video game. They just didn't know what form it should take. Jonathan Burroughs explains. It was very loose at the beginning. We did very, very, very broadly know we wanted to do a storytelling game, but the form that would take, uh, we really didn't know at all. I mean, by chance, at the same time, happened to play a 30 Flights of Loving. It, it, it felt kind of uh, epiphanal. It felt so profound. Such a, uh, a simple device like teleport, essentially teleporting the player around an, an environment, mimicking uh, editing in a game. And it worked so well and added such depth and such opportunity uh, in, in storytelling and dramatic terms. The beauty of Virginia is that there's no hand-holding, there's no tutorial to speak of, nothing to really tell the player what to do. The only mechanic available to the player is a small reticle at the center of the screen, a dot, which turns into a hollow circle indicating when something is meant to be interacted with, and then into a diamond shape when you're close enough to actually do so. This simple mechanic truly adds to the minimalist and creative approach of the game while complementing its cinematic qualities without obstructing the player with visual distractions. In typical police procedural games, the player usually walks around interacting with objects and communicating with people, hoping to further along the story beats, solve a few puzzles, and eventually crack the mystery. Virginia does away with this type of gameplay. There are no real puzzles to solve, no mini-games to play, and furthermore, no dialogue to listen to. Not a single word is spoken by any of the characters. While some may find this annoying, it challenges the player to observe their environment and take in the experience all on their own. The developers never make it too hard to figure out what to do next. 
Levels are straightforward, quite literally in fact. Interactables are generally placed right in front of the player, preventing them from getting lost or wandering off. There are no real choices to make either. The game is taking you down a linear path and just telling you a story. Furthermore, the game doesn't rely on collecting audio logs or diving into the game's menus for lore or hints. Unorthodox as it may be, it's an incredibly amazing experience and an outstanding achievement in visual storytelling. Interestingly, the decision to leave dialogue out of the game was purely practical. It was a, a, a very practically driven decision. <laughs> it just scared us too much, I think. The, the idea of the dialogue is done so well in high-end mainstream games. And to get there, you have to, so many things have to come together. You, you have to get the right actors. You have to get a good, be able to get a good performance from those actors. Obviously, you need to have written a, a, a good script in the first place. And then you need to have a system. So something that, that was apparent from 35 Spelling was the... Um, when you had the cutting, the game had a real pace to it. Like you were rattling through those scenes incredibly fast, and that's very desirable. And and, and the um, the surprise of the next scene it was is, is what generates the delight in that game to a, to a great extent. The surprise of the next story, uh, story scenario, and and, and I, I do remember having conversations with Terry where I was saying, you know, if we put dialogue in this and you come to a stop and have have kind of a, uh, a you know a, a, an adventure game style conversation system, it's potentially going to be really at odds with that pace. And I'm not even sure if we can necessarily. Uh, even if the dialogue is there, I'm worried that it, we, we just won't have the resources to do its quality. So that was kind of why we decided not to do it. Virginia's music and sound design was composed and arranged by Lyndon Holland, whom Burroughs and Kenny met by placing an ad online. The three worked well together and co-wrote a script over the course of several months. Without the use of dialogue to push the story along, the team knew music and sound design would need to be at the forefront of their project. Lyndon Holland recalls his experience. Since we were um, working without any dialogue and the music needed to sort of do a lot of the heavy lifting, that I was there for that writing process. A lot of stuff that music can do, but then there's a lot of stuff that music can't do. Like you can't be too specific. It is, music, I find, is really great at sort of giving a sense of subjectivity and mood and tone and context. You can group scenes together by having the same music played over sort of a um, whole sequence. That's, it was cool to be involved and um, help out with that because then I could sort of say, yeah, we could, we could do that with music. It should be noted that Virginia has no loading screens either. The entire game can be played in one sitting, typically around two hours, which puts even greater stress on its sound design. Scenes mesh one into the next, which means the musical score needs to account for this and seamlessly transition its musical cues without any technical hiccups. It accomplishes this quite well. There's something magical about writing a piece of music, sort of assuming in, in an abstract way in my head how it's going to work in game, not completely knowing whether it's going to work. Like when you're writing a piece of interactive music, you have to sort of have all these things in your head at, at once. And the more I did it, the more I sort of understood what you can do. Lyndon Holland took inspiration from numerous sources. So the game is set in the 1990s, and, and the, the, the key touchstone inspirations are the, the TV series from that era, so like Twin Peaks and X-Files. And so, they, they, so the music in those shows, straight away, I just thought oh, it'd be cool to like get some of that in. And I, and I had a real interest in sort of early 90s sort of action movies. James Newton Howard, especially in movies like um, Outbreak and The Fugitive, he sort of had this really cinematic use of orchestral instruments with synthesizers which are probably out of the 80s and I really liked that sound and I really liked those scores from like thrillers like Silence of the Lambs. I can't, I can't describe musically what it is I like about them but I wanted to do, I thought that would be the right tone for the, for the game. So ultimately, what is Virginia about? 
Well, that's a tough question to answer. Virginia is abstract for a reason. The game is meant to evoke an emotional response by its end, and let's face it, it is supposed to confuse the hell out of you. In broad terms, we, I think we knew from very early on that what we, we wanted Virginia to work as, I guess, as an experience where at the end of it, there wasn't necessarily a clear-cut explanation, or at least there was enough ambiguity in what the, the meaning behind the scenes or, in fact, the entire story. Uh, there's enough meaning open to interpretation that, that people could, could derive very personal meaning from that. We were very careful about this, that, that it, there, wasn't, there wasn't just weird stuff in there that, that had no, no purpose and was there just to wrong foot people. Like, there is an intent and there, are, there is an idea behind everything. As with all types of abstract art, it's meant to be discussed with others. It's meant to remain in your mind for hours, days, perhaps even weeks after completion, to have you reflect on your experience and dissect it in your own way. What did that bull mean? Male dominance? Moral resistance? Maybe. What about that acid trip? Did that even happen? Was it just a figment of Anne's imagination? Did it represent a form of escapism? Did she even get arrested? And what about the red bird? The key? The box? Is that, was that scene an out-of-body experience? What does this all mean? There are numerous theories online, and if interested, I do encourage you to do some research, get involved in a conversation. There are indeed some great articles out there, but don't dismiss this as pretentious. There really is a lot more going here. It's simply up to you to decide if you want to dig deeper to unravel its mystery. That's when I get the most out of, out of, out of art, is when it poses uh, questions or offers just enough that I think there is meaning there, and, and, and the, the, you know, the search for that, that meaning lingers with me for a a long time after I've stopped listening to the music or, you know, watching the film or whatever. And, and I, I think that's, uh, I find that so much more interesting than something that's prescriptive or that's trying to, to teach you something. I think it's better that, that art should pose questions and leave you to arrive at your own conclusions. Games like Virginia are always divisive. Over the years, gamers have come to label such games as walking simulators. Essentially, a slow-paced first-person game where people spend their time walking around and interacting with objects and people, gaining slices of narrative throughout. While Virginia mostly received positive reviews from numerous media outlets, a portion of players felt the game was simply too convoluted and its story, especially its ending, too confusing. Some praised its mechanics, while others felt it hampered and locked down the story. And while an argument could be made for either side, one thing is certain, limitation breeds creativity. And Virginia is a shining example of that. A special thank you goes out to two podcasts I found while doing my research on Virginia. The first is called Dev Diary, while the other is called Playing Catch Up. Really great interviews with Jonathan Burrows and the rest of the team. Please go ahead and check them out. There's a link in the description below. And finally, a big thank you to Spitfire Audio who did an interview with Lyndon Holland. They even did a video where Lyndon goes through how he made the score and how it changes dramatically throughout the game. So uh, I'll include a link right here for that. That's it for me. Thank you for watching. Please like the video if you, well, liked it. And subscribe to the channel to get notified whenever a new video goes up. I'll be tackling more abstract games in the future. And again, thank you all for watching. Thank you.